Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool pinball repair video for you this evening. We have been working on this 1978 Bally Kiss pinball machine for a customer. And we've been filming videos the whole way through. So if you haven't seen them, go back and check it out. We did one showing kind of the condition that this thing was in whenever we got it into the shop. The gentleman brought it to us, said he'd had it for many, many years. And uh, it hadn't worked for many, many years, and he wanted us to get it going again. Now, as you can see, we've got it up and running again, but it's uh, limping along. It definitely needs some work still. We did one video where we uh, worked on the power supply. We did a video where we worked on the MPU. And we did a video where we worked on the displays and the sound. So we got the sound working pretty good. Got all the displays working, but this one on the bottom left is tripping a little bit. There's two segments missing that uh, apparently the glass is damaged, so... One of the displays ain't all the way live, but that's all right. And uh, obviously the game has a lot of wear on it. Now, when we talked with the gentleman, he basically wants to keep this kind of original. So even with the wear, he just wants to kind of leave it like that. So we're going to clean it up, make it look the best we can with this wear. Um, this is actually quite common in KISS pinball machines for this middle section to get all worn like that. And the reason is because since there's so many inserts there, the ball would hit the edge of the wood or the edge of the insert and chip everything up. And eventually, once you got a little chip in the paint, if you kept playing it, it would just wear it all away. So unfortunately, they didn't keep it uh, waxed. On these, on these older machines, they had a thin clear coat. Um, and the, the, if, you, if you kept them waxed, it played well and it kind of protected the paint because you just had a little bit more of a layer of uh, protection there. But uh, if you uh, if you let the play field get dirty and then just kept playing it or used an old ball, the ball in this one was an old rusty one, uh, it would start eating away the paint like this. It was real common on valleys. Um, we have a Flight 2000 over here, which was a Stern game, that has the same thing going on. I mean, it's just destroyed. <laughs> Lots of artwork gone. So, unfortunately, it is a thing. Um, now, if you have one like this, there are options. So, here are your options. One, you can leave it how it is, clean it up the best you can, and play the crap out of it. That's what we're going to do with this one. Um, the, the, the gentleman doesn't, he's not really concerned with making it look brand new again. He wants it to just look vintage, and it will, <laughs> right? But he does want it to play good, so we're going to get it to play well. The damage on the play field is not going to affect the playability much. You will get a little bit different than if you had a perfect play field because these, these well, they're all pretty level, actually. These inserts, there's a little bit of a divot, you know, so it will affect the flow of the ball a little bit. But this KISS game, it's not really a like a shooter's paradise or something. You know, it doesn't have to be perfectly flat to enjoy playing the game. So, and, and you know, another thing too, I'm going to say this, and this is not intended to uh, insult KISS fans. One of our buddies is a KISS fan, and he's coming by to help us work on this. But, you know, one of the, one of the I think most KISS fans would admit that one of the draws of a KISS uh, collectible, the band, the, play, the, the, the pinball machine, any of that, is part of it is just the look of it. You know, it looks cool. It's it's uh, part of it is the image, right? So the this game, although it is a fun game, a lot of people that own this machine they don't even play it that much. They just turn it on and look at it because it's it's awesome, you know. So you know it if you leave it and it affects the playability slightly, where the ball doesn't roll quite perfectly or something, it's not that big of a deal on a Kiss pinball machine. That's just my point, right? Um. So there's that option. The other option is they make a... Uh, I think you can get a new play field for it. I don't know what that would cost, but you're, usually a new play field for, for a different vintage game would be eight dollars $900 plus shipping. And then you have to take everything off the top of this play field or get all new and install it on your new play field. And then on the bottom, you need to... Uh, put new ground braid, staple new ground braid to the play field, and then solder everything off of this harness on this play field over to the new play field, mount all of the under cabinet machinery, 
you know, a lot of work. I think we did that in a video before, didn't we? I, I can't remember if, it, if we did it in a kiss or if it was a, a lost world or a comet or a cyclone or something, but I, I believe it was a kiss now that I think about it. Um, but it was to a used play field, so it's a lot of work. Uh, if you hire somebody to do that for you, like for instance, this guy's hired me to fix this, it would be very expensive because of a lot of hours. And then you would have to buy the, the play field. So it's one of those things where do you get your value back that you spend on it? I'm not so sure. Okay, so that's one thing that you can do though. If you want to go all the way, you can put a brand new play field in it. You can put an overlay on it. So they make some overlays that cover the whole play field. A little tricky to put on because you have to take every little thing off the play field. Um, which isn't the end of the world, but it's a couple hours. Um, so, you know, all of these lane guides need to come out. Of course, all the posts and everything. Anywhere there's a switch sticking up through the play field, it needs to uh, be removed from the play field. Anywhere there's a bulb sticking up through the play field, it needs to be removed from the play field. And then you need to sand the whole play field down. Because the new overlay has the artwork for the, the inserts on the overlay. So you have to sand the whole play field down so that the you can't see double art. So you can't see the K shining through and then the K on the overlay not quite lining up and blah, blah, blah. Right? So full overlay is a little bit of work too. Now, another option is, which we've done a couple times, is they do make an overlay that basically only covers it does like this it covers just this middle area that always gets worn they make that option and it's not that hard to apply because I think the little circles for the inserts are cut out so uh, you just fit it on around the things when you're done it doesn't look perfect because of that but it looks pretty good so uh, I may have some pictures of one like that I could show you. Let me see. Let me see what I've got. That's one way you could do it. But uh, what we're going to do on this one, it, which is kind of interesting because we haven't ever really done this, we're going to clean this thing up as good as we can with the wear and just leave it like that. Another option would be you could try to hand paint all of that back in. A little tricky because there's a lot of artwork on there, but you, it could be done. Um, so, I mean, there's options. What we're doing is basically the least intrusive option. We're just going to clean it up and see how she looks clean. Um, pop bumper caps are all original. They're faded, but they are the original ones. It's vintage, baby. The spinners are the original with Jean on it. They're a little beat up, but they are original. Um, the plastics are all in pretty good shape. I don't see any of them that are cracked or anything. Apron's pretty good shape. Uh, we might take that off, but leave this because it's the original vending company. The guy, he doesn't want us to do a ton of cosmetics. He just wants us to kind of leave it looking old. We've repainted the side before too, but uh, we're not going to do that on this one. Okay, so that's what we're that's what we're shooting at. Now I'm going to have my brother. I'm Ron. I'm going to have my brother Joe clean up this play field and see what he can do to kind of speed things along. So I'm going to go home for the evening. In the morning, he's going to come in, clean the heck out of this thing, and we'll see how it looks. And then for the rest of the video, we'll see what other trouble we can get into. But this is uh, this is how we're leaving it. This is the condition as found. Basically, we haven't done anything to it yet. 
Okay, so this is what it looks like after cleaning. We still got to replace the flipper bats, but Joe, it looks pretty good. What all do you have to do to it? Clean, clean, clean. Clean, clean, clean. We still got to work on the lights, so we haven't put the pop bumper caps back on yet, but we're just going to put the originals back on. Looks a lot more presentable than it did. Joe got all the plastics clean. All the targets clean. Even the bare wood cleaned up pretty good. And then you waxed it, right Joe? Yep, lots of wax. So hopefully the wax will keep it protected where it won't get worse. But yeah, I think it looks pretty good. Now some of the lights aren't working because we haven't done any of the lights yet. Or the light boards. But wow! So it's got a it's got a cool vintage look to it for sure. So we still got to put the back glass in, and we still got to uh, we'll clean up the sides a little bit, but we're not going to repaint them. Very cool. That's crazy. That much wear. Pretty wild. All right, so all new rubber rings, all clean, waxed, brand new ball. Hopefully it won't uh, get much worse, but time will tell. Okay, folks, we're going to do a little preventative maintenance on the lamp boards. We already did the sound board, the power supply, the solenoid board, the MPU board, but we have this lamp board down here and this lamp board up here that we need to get right. You can see there's several of the bulbs that aren't really working, uh, which could just be the bulbs burn out or a socket problem. But regardless, we're going to have to uh, work on the, bo the lamp boards anyway just to make sure that everything's cool. We have some help coming to help us with the, the uh, underside of the play field. We have a, a KISS expert that's going to make a special appearance here. Uh, we, we figured we'd bring him in and he can help us work on it a little bit, get his hands dirty. Uh, just to make this authentic, like a referee with a whistle, like a cop with a pistol. <laughs> um, we'll, uh, so I'll pull out these boards and we'll work on that. And then uh, whenever he gets here, he can swap out the bulbs and we'll see if that fixes the rest of them. But uh, uh, this is the traditional Bally lamp board. And then we have this auxiliary lamp board up here that does all of these bulbs. And it's dead. Dead, dead, and more dead. Um, so uh, we kind of got to... Maybe we'll do that one first. It'll be more interesting. So like if I take out this bulb that looks new, and I take this bulb that obviously works, and I put it in there. Still nothing. We're getting nothing, people. And that bulb I took out... Works, but the socket's tripping. Um... So we've obviously got something that's, that's keeping every one of those bulbs from working. Uh, you can see that it gets its voltage from the same thing that these two bulbs get its voltage from. And they work. So it's not a wiring problem. Um, there's something going on on that board. So the first thing I want to do is check the voltages. Let's see what do we need here. It says we have a ground test point. It almost looks like maybe it's mounted in there upside down. And then we have a 5 volt test point. So I'm going to check that just to make sure they're fine. If they are, we'll pull that out and put it on the bench and see if we can figure out what must be the issue. Here is the lamp driver board. These are your inputs. These are your outputs. When I check the voltage, it does not have 5 volts on the board, and it's easy to see why. This last pin is all burned up. 
they have resoldered it, but it looks like it's no longer making contact with the trace. There's something going on there. That's the ground pin. So without a ground of the board, none of the lights would work. The way the board actually works is it grounds the lights. So it, it definitely has to have the ground. Um, uh, so the, not only are, are the chips not functioning because they don't have a ground, but there's literally the, the bulbs are connected to the voltage, but they're, this board is supposed to ground each one to turn them on. And it, the board doesn't even have a ground on it, so it can't do that. So, um, so that's our problem. So I'm going to clean all this solder off this connector, see if I can clean this up. It actually, it looks like it's pretty good. It just got kind of hot. Um, and then uh, in the cabinet, it looks like the connector, that um, uh, insulation displacement connector, looks pretty ratty on it. And that pin on it looks pretty burnt up. So I think I'm going to have to replace that connector. But that ought to get at least some of the lights working. While I have this out, I'm also going to test all of these SCRs and see if they all measure kind of similar to each other. So same thing, you set your meter on diode check and then you check from one leg to the other looking for a voltage drop and then compare it to the ones next to it. So looks like one of the legs they're all connected together and uh, between it and the other leg I don't get any reading between it and the middle leg boy this isn't working it's hard to do this with one hand folks I'm gonna have to get the uh, set up the tripod or something just to show you or you can take my word for it but basically you just want to check the voltage drop between the pins on one of the transistors and then once you figure it out like if it's 0.5 between this one and this one if this is black and this is red and that's 0.5 well you just see if this is similar it doesn't have to be exact but if it's 1.2 it's way off or if it's zero it's shorted so the way off just see if they're similar if any of them are not similar, that's probably because that one's burned up. Okay, so the uh, the ground pin, I, I definitely wasn't getting 5 volts on the board, so that was definitely a thing. Okay. So I've re-soldered everything, and I put a little jumper since that pin looked like it had, had some trauma. <laughs> uh, but here's the thing. I'm getting completely different readings on these chips when I check it with a uh, diode check. So you can do some little tricky stuff on on chips sometimes. Since they often have like transistors and gates and stuff like that inside of them, I guess they don't have transistors, but they have gates in them. You can do like this is the one of the ground traces. You can connect like your positive lead to ground, and then check the voltage drop to the different pins that are the inputs and outputs and stuff. I'm getting all kinds of readings on this, but not on this. This one's not giving me, most of the pins don't have a reading. So this chip could be bad. These are the same exact chip. You would think that they would have similar readings. MC14555. They're driven by this, which is an MC140, I can't read it. You can read it though. <laughs> I'm looking through the camera. The camera's in a way where I can't read it. MC14013, I think it says on my little tiny screen. Uh, so this, you get your signals here, feeds this chip. This chip talks to these two chips. Each one of these controls one, two, three, four, five, six of the SCRs to sync the, the, the ground and make the light turn on. Okay, so this one controls these six, this one controls these six. I'm getting a bunch of, between ground and inputs and outputs, I'm getting a bunch of uh, readings uh, on this one, but I'm not on this one. So this chip could be bad. But then, all of these SCRs, I'm getting no kind of reading at all on. No voltage drop between any of the pins, which, so maybe that's not the way to check those. That's how I usually check them on a, uh, on the regular lamp driver board, though. So, I would not be surprised if... After I replace the connector in the game, which I have to do for this, because that pin's so ugly, 
after I replace the connector in the game, if we get 5 volts on the board, and we still don't get any lights because every one of these is bad. Wouldn't be surprised. And I also wouldn't be surprised if these six work and these six don't. So uh, I'm going to go work on the connector. We'll swap it out. We'll mount this sucker in there the right way up. You see this X on the board? Boy, that don't, don't that tell you something? Somebody's already figured out this board screwed up. But we're going to fix it, people. Don't worry about it. Don't get upset. We're going to fix it. So I'm going to go work on the connector, and then we'll plug it in and see if we get our 5 volts on the board, and then we'll go from there. Start at the wall, right? If it doesn't have the power, it ain't going to work, so we got to make sure it's got the power first. Okay, so our 5 volts is back, but we are not animated. It's trying to animate a couple of them on the S lights, but I think it's going to be exactly what I was talking about. I think, I don't think it's the SCRs, because it... I mean, these might be. I don't know. Those bulbs look like they got to be fine. Yeah, so it's not animating it. I think those... Um, I think it's going to be those chips we were looking at that were giving me some wonky readings. So I think what I'll do is I'll replace one of them. And we'll see. Uh, see, that's probably halfway working. I'll replace one of them and we'll see if that gets us back uh, doing kind of what we need to do and then we'll replace the other one if that works. Okay, so we're replacing our MC14555B with a CD4555BE. It's a decoder demultiplexer. It decodes and demultiplexers all in one. Pretty cool. So this one to me didn't test right just on the board, I, I mean, on the table, I couldn't tell. I, you know, I guess I could check one. I can't, I don't have, a, I gotta go get my stuff. Uh, we'll just pop it in the game and see what happens. But I think that one's going to bring back a whole bunch of them. So the ones that were locked on, I think this may, uh, I think this may fix it up for us. So, um, you know, I, I was reading the data sheet and they were saying that the B variant, now you tech guys, I am not trying to say I know this. You can... You can fact check me here. I know you like to fact check me. They say that the CD455B, that the B denotes that whenever it's selected that it goes active high. The output goes high. So, I believe the way they're in the machine, the lights are... Um, they have the uh, they have the uh, the five volts. It's six volts actually, I think. But the the five or six volts running through that one line that we saw to all of the sockets, and then the other socket, the ground, is what's actually controlled by the SCR. So I believe what ha what is happening, and I may be wrong, is oh you know what since it uses these. I got this all wrong. Okay, so basically it has to ground it to get the light to turn on. So I think, isn't that a nasty cut? Look at that. about cut myself open down there working with my brother Donnie the other day. Um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. So this, if it goes active high, I would suppose that turns on the SCR, which then connects ground to the bulb on the other end. And that's what's making it do its thing. But what appears to be happening is, before, since I wasn't getting any voltage drop, I guess this was basically dead. Uh, I don't know how that would make it where the lights were always on, though. Hmm. But anyway, we don't even know if it works yet. But we'll go pop it in and see. My finger cut. So, on the weekends, Donnie and I, my brother Donnie, if you don't know about my brother Donnie, if you go down below, there's a link to his channel here on YouTube. And he and I, on the weekends, get in all kinds of trouble. What we're doing is, we bought a couple buildings in a little town near here, um, in downtown. The old buildings from the 20s. And we bought them up very uh, depressed and undervalued. They're just little tiny buildings. And we've been fixing them up. Just like we're fixing up this old KISS pinball machine. But we're fixing up entire buildings. 
and uh, we're getting them ready for people to rent so a little little business can start up in there and help revitalize the downtown area of that town. What do you think about that? So I did this the other day while we were installing something in the wall. I cut my finger open on a screw that we didn't. We ran too long of a screw and it sliced me right open. But uh, go check that out. If you haven't yet, my brother Donnie, the link is down below. I'm going to go put this in the video, in the, uh, in the uh, cabinet. And hopefully that'll bring back like the first two letters and make them start doing their thing like they're supposed to. And if it does, we'll replace this one to finish it out. Uh-huh. So the top, the top chip does the top half of the letters. It's starting to come back, people. It's coming alive. Like Frampton, since we're talking 70s rock. Right? Frampton comes alive. Kiss comes back. I'll bet there's a Kiss coming back tour song or something. They've retired and unretired like 10 times. Well, I'll tell you what. These Kiss guys really know how to make money. I really admire that. <laughs> I have now. I have never heard of Kiss. Maybe maybe I should wait till the next video because we're going to have our buddy come in and help us that knows all about Kiss. I've never heard of Kiss doing anything immoral to make money. They just sell things for an ungodly amount of money, and people buy it because they're such huge fans. Because the band kicks ass. But anyway, this is starting to look like a rock band type thing here, isn't it? So the one chip got these back. Is that bulb dead? Yeah. Need to replace some bulbs. But um, it's starting to do its its rock band type thing, right? So we're going to replace that other chip, and hopefully that'll get us all these back. And uh, boy, that would be something, wouldn't it? All right, folks. So I replaced the other chip, and that did not fix it. It did the exact same thing. Well, isn't that strange? Why would it do that? Why would it do the exact same thing? So... There was only one chip left on the board, but it forced me to look at the schematics. So I thought I would show you the schematics and we'd look at it a little bit so that we could um, figure out how this thing works. Okay, now keep in mind that I thought either all 10 of the uh, SCRs would be bad or that that top chip would be bad. The top chip was bad. The bottom chip wasn't bad, right? So, um, here's what we're looking at. Signals come in on this connector. So you have your ground, which comes in on three things, but there's only one wire going to it. That's the pin that was all burned up. And then you have your five volts coming in on one of them. And then you get two signals here, AD0 and AD1 coming from the MPU. And then you get a lamp strobe signal and then you get these, PD0, PD1, PD2, and PD3, okay? So that's what's coming from the MPU. Now, AD0 and AD1 come over to this MC14013. And you see it's got a whole bunch of pins tied to ground. And then it also gets the lamp strobe pin on the C1 and the C2. See the C1 down below it, how there's a little dot? It's faded a little bit, but there's there's two lines running there. So this lamp strobe goes to C1 and C2, which I guess means clear one and clear two, something like that. And then it has two outputs that are the Q1 and the Q2, which is 1 and 13, right? And then that comes over here to our, our chips that we were replacing, the MC14555s, which are decoder... D multiplexers. Keep in mind, I am not super technical, so I never went to school for this. I'm just telling you what we're figuring out here because it's interesting. So look at this uh, MC14555B. It says U2A, and the one below it says U2B. This one says U3A, and then this one is U3B. So whenever they name them A and B, what they're saying is, is that the chip has basically two sets of the same functions. So you see it's got A and B and then an E, enable uh, line, or not enable line. It's got the line over it. And then it's got Q0, Q1, Q2, and Q3. Those are the outputs. And then 
U2B has the same thing, but it's on different pins. So 14 and 13 are the A and B. Look, they're tied to pin 2 and 3 because they're being ran by the same inputs. So the inputs go to this, and then the second side of this chip, the same chip. Right? So it's got two, two sets that can do outputs. You know, it's, it's basically got two sets of turning two lines into four outputs, decoding it, right? And so the outputs on it are also Q, Q0, Q1, Q2, and Q3, but it's pins 12, 11, 10, and 9. And then the same signals go down here to U3, and it's the same thing. So you're getting the same inputs, and you're getting the same outputs. Now what would change, so if this sends signals to this and does it, it's sending them to all four of them at the same time, because it's just using the same two lines. So there's no timing thing or anything. Like it can't send a signal to this, wait a millisecond, and then send it to this. Look, they're all tied together. So it's sending the same information, A and B. A is high, B is low, or they're both low, or they're both high, or whatever, right? On all of them at the same time. Okay, so what's controlling it is this not enable line, which comes straight from the, the MPU board. PD0, PD1, PD2, PD3. So that's turning on and off each one of these sets, which is basically making kind of like a strobe, right? Which the lamp strobe line is also going to this. So anyway, so if you if you look, now the schematic, since it's online, it's, the paper's cut in half, but the chips that we're replacing, the 14555s, have four outputs. So 4, 5, 6, and 7, 12, 11, 10, and 9, and then the other one has 4, 5, 6, 11, uh, 6, and 7, and then uh, 12, 11, 10, and 9. So there's four sets of four outputs, right? So if I go down to the next sheet, you have a bulb chart. Yeah, this is interesting, too. Okay, so the, the paper's cut, but you see the four outputs coming out of the chip right there. The bottom one is NU, not used, on each one. So on all four sets, the bottom one is not used. But the top three of each output are used. So what do they do? They come over here to the SCR and then leave the board on a pin. So that's your, that's your, um, um, it's an MCR 106-1 Motorola stuff that use weird numbers sometimes. Uh, so that's your 12 SCRs capable of 12 light outputs, right? But if you remember looking on the back of the bo of the board, some of them have two bulbs instead of one on the same wire. So what's going on there? Well, since it's a KISS machine, uh, what's the best way to put this? Okay, see the K? So you have one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, but they don't really need all of that. They can just have two, two uh, bulbs on each one. So they could have... 1 and 2 turn on at the same time, 5 and 6 turn on at the same time, 3 and 4 turn on at the same time. So over here, K1, 2 is the top two. K3, 4 is the bottom two. K5 and 6 is the middle two. So think about what we had. We had the top two working. K1, 2 was working. Well, that's the top select line, Q0, coming out of that one uh, 14555 chip, okay? But remember, there's two sets of it. So the second set, the Q0, which would be controlled by the same inputs, does I1. Well, that one also worked, but 3 and 2 didn't. 5, 6, 3, and 4 of the K didn't work. Okay, so on the S's, it's a little bit different than it shows here. It says 1, 2, 3, and 4, um, but one and two are tied together. And the reason that they did that was because this is the American KISS logo, but there's a German KISS logo that is more of a slanted, or I'm sorry, this is the German KISS logo, but the American KISS logo is more slanted. And the reason for that is because it's very similar to the Nazi S. And so in Germany, they were like, hell no, <laughs> had enough of that. So they insisted that they make their S's like this. So in America, they got the cool jagged S that looks very edgy. Uh, but in over in Germany and I, probably other parts of Europe, you couldn't do that. It had to be a more traditional S, right? So they it's set up a little different. But in the American one, these two come on together because it's more just how it's shaped. So 
Anyway, they kind of denote that on the thing. So they say SA bulbs 1 and 2, but look what drives them. It's also Q0 coming out of that one chip. That's the one that was actually good. We thought it was messed up, or I thought it was messed up, but it was actually good. And then finally, the last Q0 runs SB 1 and 2. Okay, so this is SB, the second B, 1 and 2. All of those are working. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Q0 is working on all four of the sets of outputs. But Q1 ain't doing a damn thing, and Q2 ain't doing a damn thing, and Q3 is in you, it's not used. So Q0, that output is enabling, is making the lights come on, and then they're strobing and all that crap. But uh, Q1 and Q2 never work. So do you understand what I'm saying? This top line is Q0 coming out of that one chip. It's working. Q1 never works. Q2 never works. Q3 doesn't turn on. Right, so that works. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. So w what in the world is going on? So look at our two inputs. The only thing that controls it is A, B, and then this enable not line that comes straight from the MPU. Right. So if we look up a data sheet on these MC one four five five fives, it kind of shows us what must be happening. Let me see here. Okay, so this is the MC14555. See how they're showing you that there are actually two sets. It's like two chips together with one common ground and one common power pin, but it has two sets of inputs and two sets of outputs. So that's exactly what we were looking at on our sheet. So here is the truth table. So it shows you that when the enable pin is low, it's at zero, The in, which is the input of the chips that we that we um, uh, that we replaced. The enable pin is at zero. So remember, the enable pin was coming from the MPU, just straight from the edge connector. And when B and A, both of the inputs are low, zero and zero. Q3 is low. Q2 is low. Q1 is low. But Q1 is high. So it's enabling Q0 to be high. Well, that's what we got going on. Q0 is working, but how is it turning back off? It's because the enable pin is eventually going high, and when it goes high, it makes all four of the outputs low. Turns all the bulbs off. So what's going on is A and B are staying low, which is making it where Q0 is always high. That's why they're working. And the reason they're turning on and off is because the enable pin is working because it's coming from the MPU, right? So it's taking it from 1 to 0, 1 to 0. And that's why we're getting the lights turning on and off and doing their thing. But Q1 never works, so that's the next lights down on each one of them. So I thought it was the other chip. It's not because it's not controlled by that. Q1 never works because for it to work, A would have to go high. Okay, and Q2 never works because for it to work, B would have to go high. So our problem is A and B are never going high, and that's why only Q0 can work. But our enable must be working, right? So if we go back to the schematics. If this were low, A is low, and if this were low, B is low, Q0 would be high, and it is, and it would turn off whenever this enable change state, this enable not, I guess it is, change state coming from the actual MPU off the board. So, in other words, this chip screwed up. Either this chip screwed up or these two inputs are screwed up, but... The MPU, everything on it's working because all of the solenoids are working, all the sounds are working, all the lights are working. It's just our problems on this chip. Okay, so now remember too, I was saying, oh wow, look, it made all of the top ones work. I thought it made the first two ones. Now, I figured that it would have the, the ones on the left work and the ones on the right wouldn't. Well, if you look, so there's the K and there's the I. Both of those are controlled by the one chip. 
and then there's the SA and SB, and they're both controlled by the other chip. So I was actually right. One chip controls these two, and one chip controls these two. But if the inputs are screwed up, it gets you where only the top is, is working. So what ultimately was the problem? Ultimately, the top MC14555 was bad, and the MC14013 was bad. So I replaced both of the, I basically have ended up replacing all three chips because I also replaced the, the other MC14555 and it didn't fix anything, which controls these two. But I uh, replaced all three chips ultimately. And we're back in business. That's how it ought to look. How freaking cool is that? Look at that. Keep it simple, stupid. Look at that. Awesome. Boy, she's getting there. Still got to figure out what we're going to do about the display. But... Very, very cool. Okay, so I'm going to pull out the other lamp board that controls all the other lamps uh, on the play field. And uh, let's check it out. We should be able to run through it pretty quick. That's just your standard uh, lamp board that's in all of them. This is the auxiliary board that was in this and Future Spa and a couple other ones. So freaking cool though. So this is Bally's traditional lamp driver board. This is in every Bally pinball machine. There's some that look a little different, but they all do the same thing. So it gets its signal from up here. Those are these four chips which turn on these SCRs or these SCRs and just turns on lights, turns them on and off, blah, 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 blah. These are very common boards. Um, uh, they're usually in at least most of the way work. You know, you may have a few of the SCRs that aren't working and so you get some dead bulbs or something. But in general, you can take one of these off of a pile of parts, put it in a game and most of the bulbs will work. So they're, they're really reliable. From time to time, one of these chips will die, but it's rare. You don't get too much of it, knock on wood. Hopefully we won't have one. <laughs> um, so you get your signals in up here, and then uh, some of the lines go out this connector and control the ones in the back box. So the lights up in the back box on the, on the back panel are usually fed off of this line. And then these two connectors usually go to the play field. Now, the, uh, Bally did not use a lamp matrix. Some of the other companies, like Williams uh, famously, used a lamp matrix. So basically, they had columns and rows of lamps, and depending on which two lines were active at the same time, that light lit up. But uh, Bally had an individual SCR for either each light or two lamps. Later on, uh, whenever they, um, I think it was with their 6803 games, they basically ran them off AC, uh, and again, I'm not an engineer, so I don't completely understand this, but they ran them off AC so that they could run half the lights when the AC was above <laughs> ground or whatever, and the other half when it was below. So by doing that, they had, they had two different phases, basically, so they could run twice as many lamps controlled uh, by using a strobe and stuff with the same number of... of um, SCRs and or half the number of SCRs, so their their setup in the 6803s was just freaking awesome. But these this was their first solid state setup. So basically, well, how do you fix these? Well, this is the connector for the back box, like I said, and you saw that most of those are working. So look at the condition of the connector. See how it looks fairly clean. Now you're looking at a 42 year old connector, right? Looks pretty good. Okay. Now look at this one. See how that looks? So what is all that stuff? It's just oxidization, oxidation, you know, might even be a little bit of rust, tarnish, it's just junk. Well the little pin that's connected to that post, that pin, if it's not conducting electrically, guess what? Your bulb doesn't work. So you got to clean that. Some people say replace the connectors. I've never really had to do that much. Clean that up. Use like a little little bit of sandpaper, a little brush or something. Clean those suckers up. Get it nice and shiny. When you do that, sometimes you take off some of the tin coating on it, which isn't optimal, you know. So, I mean, if you're doing it for yourself and you want to take the time, you can just replace all of these headers. They're not that expensive, <coughs> except for shipping. <clears throat> um, 
Uh, and once you get those clean, you will get almost all of your lights back. But then you'll have a few more that don't work. And the reason they don't work is because of bad solder joints. So if you look, especially on the edge, usually the last few pins, if they have never been re-soldered, see that very first one? See how it looks like a freaking volcano? That's because the pin is no longer touching the board. There's solder there, but it ain't very good. And I, about the first three of them are like that. Well, those three bulbs don't work. I don't, I don't know which bulbs those are, but I'll bet you they don't work. You betcha. <laughs> I'm Canadian now. <laughs> Love our Canadian friends, by the way. Um, we really do. I'm not being sarcastic. I just, you know. We love Canadians. Who doesn't? Okay, pa Canada gave us Pamela Anderson. I mean, hell, what's not to like? Now, I know you gave us Justin Bieber, too, but I'm willing to forgive that because you gave us Pamela Anderson. Okay, so you got a few here that are messed up, too. See that one? See the little ring around it? It's no bueno, amigo. Now I'm Mexican. Love Mexico. Gave us, uh, they gave us a bunch of cool people, too. <laughs> Okay, so I want to our next one. It looks messed up too. All right, so we just we're gonna resolder every freaking pin. Now don't be a, don't be a. a I don't want to curse any more than I probably already have, but don't resolder two of them. Resolder them all, people. If these two already broke, you know this one's on the way out. Come on. But the reason the ones on the edge break is because when you pull the connector off, you do it from one end or the other, and it always gets to the end, and the last two or three are still stuck on there, and then you like a you freaking snap it off, and it stresses it. It doesn't like stress, people. Okay, so I'm going to resolder all those, and I'm going to clean the pins on the other side, and that's probably going to fix 99% of the bulbs. But then I'm going to take the multimeter... And the same thing I was squawking about earlier, I'm going to check cathode, anode, ground, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to check uh, between the pins on the three, the three pins on the uh, SCR and uh, just compare them to each other. And if I find one that's way out of whack, well, I know that one's probably screwed up. You don't need to take them out of the board or nothing because the reason you can test them in the board you can't test specifics, but you can test them against each other because they're all wired the same. They're all connected to resistors and this chip here and then a pin on the edge. So that they're all in the same kind of thing. So you don't have to memorize how to test this specific 2N5060. It's a 2N5060 SCR. Uh, you don't need to know how to test that specifically. You just need to know that there's 30 of them here. And this one, and this one, and this one, and this one should all test the same. So that saves you all kinds of time troubleshooting because you don't have to try to memorize how every little thing works, right? Same with these. Just connect, compare them all to each other. And if you get like this one's different than these two, we'll check this one to make sure because it's in the same position. You know, just stuff like that. And if you find one that seems way off, that's probably the problem. On that other board we were just doing, that's exactly what I did with the chips. But one of them just tested different than the other one, and they were exactly the same. It shouldn't have been like that, right? Okay, so I'm going to clean these, solder it, check all those, and if I run into anything interesting, I will let you know. Okay, folks, so we got it cleaned up, resoldered. Hopefully everything's good now. What do you think? All of the... Uh, SCRs tested exactly the same as each other. I was able to clean up the uh, connectors. Um, so there's nothing really wrong with this board. You saw the bad solder and the dirty connect, the dirty pins. Now sometimes you will have uh, the pins inside the connector are like that too. So we might have to replace some of those. But you know that's a job nobody's really signing up to do. You know. <laughs> So hopefully they're fine, but uh, you can repin specific pins if you have a problem specifically, or repin the whole things if you want to. So I'm gonna slide this back in, and we're gonna see if that got any of those not working lights back doing their thing. 
Well, that got some more of them working, but we've still got several that aren't working right. So uh, we, we literally haven't replaced the bulbs yet, though. So we're saving that because our, uh, our buddy Brant is coming by. He's going to help us work on it a little bit, and we'll do that on the next video. So we're going to have a real KISS fan who knows all about the band come in and help us mess around with this machine a little bit and uh, finish it up for this customer. And we're going to do that on the next video. So make sure that you are here next time because uh, we'll get some information about what it was like to play this thing back in the day and what it was like being a KISS fan back then. Just barely before my time, I was born in 78. So I was like just a little bit too young to catch the whole KISS thing. But uh, we're going to get it straight from a super fan on the next video. So make sure to check that out. Leave your comments down below. Let us know what you think. This thing's going to be so sweet whenever we put the back glass back in it. Make sure to give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film this for you. And uh, if, you, uh, if, you, <laughs> if you haven't been there, check out our website. Go to lionsarcade.com. I was looking at something outside. Go to lionsarcade.com. That is our website. It lists all of our arcade games, pinball machines, jukeboxes that we have in available at the moment for sale. You can check that out. There's also a coming soon list on there you can check out. There's a parts page on there where we put links to some of the stuff that we use in, uh, in our repairs. And uh, we also have like t-shirts and coffee mugs and wall paintings and all that stuff. So if you're <laughs> into something like that, we just got a new logo, by the way. So we have a new t-shirt. If you got to collect them all, you might want to check out our new, uh, our new logo. It looks pretty cool. Uh, so go check that out. That's lionsarcade.com. Don't forget about my brother Donnie, and we will see you on the next one.